Well, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Michael Levy. I'm born in Brazil. I live in Paris. I am a member of the Fourth International since 1969, presently at the French section of the Fourth International, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? And I have been writing in the last few years a lot on eco-socialism, which is our topic today. Good. So I think the first uh, question we have to deal with is the ecological crisis. Yeah? The ecological crisis is already and is going to be even more in the next few years the key political question of our times. Uh, I believe really that this is a, a fundamental issue of our times because it is a threat. It is a threat without precedent in the history of humanity. Yeah? A threat not to the planet, as usually people say, not the planet, which is in there, it's life in the planet, all forms of life, including our own, yeah? Because if we permit business as usual of capitalism to continue for another few decades, there will be a process of climate change with dramatic consequences, dramatic consequences, not only to biodiversity, but the, for the conditions of life in the earth. Yeah? And we know uh, the consequences of climate change. We know it's a, a rise of the level of the seas, which will mean that possibly uh, in a few decades, uh, most towns of human civilization from Rio de Janeiro, Hong Kong, Amsterdam, Venice, London, New York, etc., etc. Shanghai will be under water, under water, just like that. Yeah? And desertification will grow. Yes? Uh, drinking water sources will shrink, perhaps disappear. It's unbelievable. Yeah? And after temperature goes beyond 1,5 degrees above pre-industrial times, we know it will begin an uncontrollable process of climate change with really dramatic consequences. So, and this will not happen in 2000, sometimes uh, scientists or media speak, uh, well, look what will happen in 2000. No, it's not 2000, it's in the next few decades. This is going, it's already began. We know it's already began. We see the monstrous, uh, uh, forest uh, burning around the world. Yeah, this will increase two times, four times, ten times in the next decade, yeah? and so on. Yeah? So let's not think uh, it's a vague threat for 2,000. No, it's in the next few decades that this is going to get worse and worse. So we have to do something about it. Yeah. Well, so this is why uh, we. Uh, think that it's urgent to act. Now, uh, the, re the, the cause of this destruction, we know as eco-socialists, it is a capitalist system. Yeah? It's not this or that government, of course, there are governments who are completely ecocidal, yeah? bent on the destruction of nature, like uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, that Morrison in Australia, Trump, also was in the United States and so on the long list yeah but it's it's much worse it's it's not a f some governments it's the whole it's a whole capitalist system which cannot exist without expansion growth competition accumulation of capital and profit and then therefore inevitably uh, growth and destruction of the environment and climate change because it's this growth, and expansion is based on fossil fuels, which are responsible for climate change. Okay, I think you know that, so I'm not going into the details. The best demonstration that the problem has to do with this capitalist system is the total failure of the so-called COP, COP, the meetings of the United Nations on climate change. The last one was in Glasgow, 
complete fiasco. Yeah? The mountain gave birth to a mouse, as usual, at such conferences. Yeah? So th this is the best demonstration that the governments, which practically almost all are at the service of the capitalist system, are unable to deal with the problem. Because to deal with the problem is to uh, attack the capitalist system itself, yeah, which is the cause of it. Yeah? And this, of course, they don't want to do or cannot do. Neither want nor can do it. Now, uh, so what the, this crisis, this ecological crisis, uh, um, requires from us is to change our understanding both of what is capitalism and what is socialism. It changed our understanding of capitalism. Traditionally, we, the left, the Marxists, used to see capitalism as a system of exploitation, yeah, of social injustice and exploitation, which of course it is <laughs> even worse now than ever. Yeah? But it is also something else. It is a system of destruction, destruction of human lives, of communities, and of the environment end of the ecological equilibrium. Yeah? So it is a destructive system. And this uh, is a very, very important uh, insight. But the ecological crisis also uh, requires from us to change our understanding of socialism. Yeah? Traditionally, even in some writing of Marx and Engels, socialism is about the change of the relations of production. Yeah? And Engels, or even sometimes Marx say, capitalist relations of production became chains, obstacles to the free development of productive force. The productive force created by capitalism cannot continue to develop. They are being contained yes, by these relations of production. So we have to change to re, uh, through a revolution, yes, re, the capitalist relations of production, particularly the private property of means of production, and replace it by the collective uh, socialized appropriation, yes. Of course, this is true, yeah, but it is not enough, yeah. And our aim is not to the free development of the force of production created by capitalism, no, because these forces of production, the a, a productive apparatus itself is capitalist and is responsible for climate change, ecological destruction, and uh, catastrophe. Yeah? So we have to change not only the relation to production, of course, replace private property by collective property, but we have completely to change the productive apparatus. First of all, its sources of energy because capitalism is based in the last 200 years on fossil fuels, yeah? on, fossil, on coal, oil, and gas to some extent. Yeah? And these are the responsible for, main responsible yeah, for climate change. Yeah? So, uh, but, but it's not only, the, it's the whole productive apparatus, the way it functions, yeah? it's uh, completely subordinated to uh, the logic of capitalism. Marx once wrote about the Paris Commune that the workers cannot appropriate themselves of the state apparatus and put it at their service. They have to break it and replace it by something else. I think, as eco-socialists, that the same applies to the productive apparatus. It has to be, so to say, broke down yeah, and replaced by another way of producing another logic of production, another sources of energy, etc., etc. Yeah? And so our understanding of socialism changed. This is why we speak of eco-socialism. We understand socialism today, eco-socialism, as a change both in the relations of production, in the productive apparatus, in the pattern of consumption, yeah? which is completely distorted by capitalism, by publicity, by uh, inbuilt obsolescence, etc., etc. All of these create a pattern of consumption which is totally irrational and which is among the causes leading to ecological catastrophe. Yeah? So we have to change also the pattern of consumption, the way 
of transportation, both of commodities and of people, because the present system based on private car and trucks is a disaster from the ecological viewpoint, and so on. So it is a very radical change because it goes to the roots of the problem. And the root of the problem is capitalism, the capitalist industrial modern civilization. So what eco-socialism proposed is a new civilization. So it's a very profound and a very radical change, a change in the paradigm of civilization. Now, where is Marx in this story? Eh? Well, Marx should be considered, I think, legitimately as a Marx and Engels together, yeah, as pioneers of eco-socialism. Yeah? Because we find in their writings many important insights. Yeah? And this has been being developed in the last few years, particularly by the so-called school of met the metabolical break, rift, the metabolical rift. Uh, John Bellamy Foster, and his friends, his comrades, yeah? and monthly review, they have done a very important job of rereading re Marx and discovering in Marx elements which had been neglected yeah? very often by the Marxist tradition, yeah? which showed that Marx had and Engels had some very powerful insights of how capitalism was destroying the environment, destroying nature destroying the fertility of the land, destroying the forest, etc. Yeah. And also in some of their writing appears the idea that socialism will introduce a new relationship to the environment beyond this metabolic rift produced by capitalism. Yeah. So there, there are some important insights. Uh, one of the followers of this school of the metabolic rift is uh, a young Japanese uh, Marxist scholar called Saito. He has also written an interesting book showing how Marx and Engels' ideas on the environment evolved during the years. Yeah? While in the early years, they didn't pay much attention to it. Later, in Capital and after, they became increasingly worried about this issue. They read writings by, for instance, by a chemist called Liebig, about the problem of fertility of the land and so on. So be they became increasingly aware of this uh, threat to the natural environment by the dynamics of capital. So I think this is an Im important contribution to our discussion. The only criticism I would make both to Bellamy Foster, Saito and the other of the metabolic rift school of this eco-Marxist is that they exaggerate a little bit, yeah? Importance of this ecological insight in Marx. Yeah? Because uh, uh, Saito even writes at some moment, well, it was the most important issue for Marx, uh, the ecological uh, question. Right? No, really, it was not, yeah? And uh, not one chapter on ecology in the three volumes of Capital, yeah? thousands of pages, but there's not one chapter on ecology, yeah? Why? For a very simple reason. Eco the ecological crisis was not, at that time, in the 19th century, a key political issue. Of course, it was beginning already. Yeah? So they had some very important insight, but it was not a central issue for them. It could not be, because in reality, it was not a central issue. Yeah? It was something which was just beginning. Yeah? So uh, ecology, the ecological crisis could not be a key issue for Marx and Engels because it was not a key issue for the situation of the environment in the 19th century. But now, in the 21st century, it is a key, essential, decisive political question. Yeah? So this we, why we have to start with Marx and, of course, use all of Marx's insight and, of course, Marx's critique of political economy and Marx's idea of communism, etc. But we have to develop yeah, the Marxist thing. Marxist thinking is not something which is uh, ready uh, in the writings of Marx and Engels. It has developed throughout the 20th century with uh, Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, 
eh, José Carlos Mariátegui, Che Guevara, and so on. So, uh, Ernest Mandel. <laughs> of course, yeah, Marxism is a living th thought which develops. Yeah? And today, he has to take uh, inside the, the ecological image. Yeah? This is why we speak of eco-social. This is why the Fourth International adopted an eco-socialist resolution. Yeah? So, uh, this is about Marx, yeah? Uh, one word about degrowth, because there is an important current in ecology, in the ecological movement, whose banner is degrowth. So I think we have to discuss this. It's an important issue, yeah? Well, uh, the degrowth movement is quite heterogeneous. There is, I would say, a right wing and a left wing. The right wing believe that there can exist such a thing as capitalism with degrowth or market economy with degrowth. Yeah? So they believe that they can persuade the capitalists to reduce growth and et cetera. Well, which of course is a complete illusion, complete uh, absolute illusion because the logic of capitalism is needs growth in the competition. Yeah, a capitalist which participates in the market and doesn't try to grow to improve his business to sell more and more commodities, he will disappear. He will be eliminated by his competitors. Yeah, if he produces less commodities, he will be thrown out of the market. Yeah? So they cannot. It's not even if they want it. Even if they were suddenly they became illuminated by ecology. No, they cannot do it. It's against the logic of the system. Yeah. So these uh, capitalist degrowth ecologists are on the wrong side. Yeah. Now we have the left degrowth people. Yeah? And with them, we can have a dialogue yeah? because they say that in order to have degrowth, you have to be, get rid of capitalism. They are anti-capitalist. And so we agree. Yeah. But where we disagree is that in a socialist or post capitalist society, uh, can we say that the, the main uh, you know, the main pattern, the main the basic uh, rule of the economic process will be degrowth? There is a problem with this. Why? Because uh, if you think rationally in a socialist transition or post-capitalist society, uh, some production, some economic activities, they shouldn't only degrow, they shouldn't be reduced, they should disappear. We don't want in a socialist society produce nuclear submarines, to give one example. Eh? Uh, or uh, uh, atomic uh, weapons, uh, etc. Yeah? Uh, we don't want advertisement, zero advert. We don't need that. A capitalist needs advertisement, yeah, yeah, which is a complete absurd irrationality. Yeah? But in a socialism, we, we don't need advertisement. We need uh, information of the consumer, which is something completely different. And advertising consumers an immense amount of labor, electricity, uh, raw materials, etc. It's completely absurd. Uh, and we want this, this is activities we want to get rid of, and there's a long list of them, yeah, atomic energy and so on and so on. Uh, others, yeah, and obviously uh, the production of oil and coal we have to leave uh, oil in the soil and coal in the hole, as the slogan goes. Yeah? We have to do this, not in one year or two, but in the process, we have to get rid, reduce uh, maximum the use of oil and coal, which are responsible for uh, climate change, as you know. Well, uh, so th these activities have to be, so to say, phased out. Yeah? Phased out. All the productions we want to reduce, for instance, the consumption of meat. The production of meat is one of the main causes of 
climate change. I cannot explain you have the mechanism probably you have read about, it, but the production of meat has to be dramatically reduced, dramatically reduced, yeah, particularly in the rich countries. The poor countries don't eat, the people don't eat very much meat, but in the capitalist advanced countries, Europe, United States, uh, Australia, Japan, and so on, Canada, they, they consume uh, enormous amounts of meat. And some countries in the South too, like Argentina, uh, and some social classes consume a lot of meat, not the poor people, and so on. So we have to reduce dramatically the consumption of meat. Uh, so this is also, it's a problem, of course, because uh, people are used to it. Yeah, but we have to reduce it. Not suppress it, yeah, not uh, eliminate it, but reduce it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the use of cars, private cars, yeah, also something we have to reduce. It's impossible to continue with this total absurd, irrational system of transport with private cars, etc. We have to reduce it, not suppress it, but reduce it, and so on and so on. Yeah. So these are things we want, some things we want to suppress completely, others we want to reduce, but others we want to grow them to grow. We want more biological agriculture. We want to suppress industrial agriculture, capitalist agriculture based on pesticides and so it's a fertilizer. And we want to promote organic biological agriculture, which is very small today. We want it to grow. Yeah? We want to develop alternative sources of energy based on the wind, on the sun, on water, etc. Yeah? They have to grow if we want to have electricity. Yeah? And we want the growth of education, health, more hospitals, more schools, et cetera. Et cetera yeah? So some things have to disappear, others have to be reduced and others have to grow. So the word degrowth doesn't do, doesn't give us this qualitative distinction. Yeah? It's too vague, too general and too abstract. Now, who is going to decide what we want to grow, what we want to degrow, what should disappear, what should not disappear. Who is going to decide this? The market? No, because the market is blind and is controlled by those who hold yeah, the keys of the market, the industrial banks, the capital, etc. No. Uh, and the market is decided by those who have more money, etc. No, we cannot leave this to the market. And we cannot leave it to a political bureau to decide, yeah, because we saw the consequences in the Soviet Union, etc. No. So we believe in democratic ecological planning, which means that the people themselves will decide what are the priorities of production. What do we need? Yeah, we need, of course, food, we need water, we need basic sanity, we need more schools and hospitals, etc. Yeah, basic needs. And uh, so the people themselves will decide what should be produced, how it should be distributed, et cetera, the production consumption, the investment, what we, or, on what things we should invest. So the basic economic decision should be made by the people themselves based on their real needs and on the respect for the environment, for the ecological equilibrium. Yeah? These are the two criteria for the democratic ecological planning. Yeah? Uh, now, uh, how can we be sure that the people will make the right decisions? We cannot be sure. People make, make uh, there can be wrong decisions, of course, yeah? but it, this is preferable to any other form, but we, we cannot leave decisions in the hand of a bureaucracy or of scientists or whatever. Yeah? The only who can take the good decisions are the people themselves, even if sometimes they make mistakes. And they will decide what are their real needs. And we believe that once you suppress advertisement, people slowly will come to see what are their needs. And if you suppress publicity for Coca-Cola for some 10 years, people may forget that they absolutely need to drink Coca-Cola and so on and so on and so on. Yeah? So that's our uh, wager, yeah? on a wager on the ration, democratic rationality and ecological, democratic and ecological rationality of the people. 
Uh, so this is uh, uh, our proposal. It's a classical socialist proposal of course, planning, yeah? But only we, democratic planning is a central uh, component uh, of, of the Marxist uh, conception of uh, socialism and communism, yeah? But we introduce the new dimension is the ecological dimension. That means this planning has to take into account the limits of the planet, the ecological equilibrium, the need to stop the process of climate change. Of course, this has to be uh, at the center of the uh, process of democratic planning. So, uh, see, so th this is why we believe, this is why we call ourselves eco-socialists, because we believe that a socialism without ecology is, uh, is a failure. Yeah, and the story of the Soviet Union is a good example of this. Yeah? And what's happening in China today also, yeah? if there is socialism there, which I doubt anyhow. Uh, so we, we have uh, to criticize the non, the anti-ecological currents in 20th century socialism, being either the Stalinist or the social democrats. The social democrats also, they, ignored ecological issues, they just uh, continue to follow the rules of the capitalist system. Yeah? So we need a different kind of socialism, yeah? which is neither this uh, anti, this productivist, let's say this way, productivist socialism of the 20th century, either in its Stalinist or social democratic form. And uh, so we, uh, that's why we say uh, socialism without ecology is a, it's a failure. And it, uh, at the same time, an ecology without socialism, a market ecology, is also a failure. Eh? We have seen all kinds of green parties participating in governments, etc. And uh, of course, uh, if they go by the rules of the market, uh, it cannot confront the ecological issue. Uh, which has to do with the capitalist system. Yeah. So uh, we criticize, uh, we criticize market ecology and uh, non-socialist ecology. But at the same time, this is a challenge for us. We have to persuade our comrades who are activists in the left on one side and in the ecological movement on the other side, we have to persuade them uh, that eco-socialism is the alternative, that uh, as I said, socialism without ecology or ecology without socialism are not the solution. Yeah, so it's a, we have to make a job of discussion and persuasion with our comrades of the movements. Yeah, so we have to help uh, to develop a double awakening. Yeah, to use that term, which is now very fashionable, to awake consciousness of the need for ecology and socialism at the same time. Now, uh, now uh, eco-socialism will not happen from one day to the other. Yeah? It, it has to begin here and now with concrete struggles. Yeah? We have to start with concrete struggles. And this is the only hope that we will achieve, perhaps there's no guarantee, one day, a kind of eco-socialist transition. Yeah? Uh, of course, ecological, it's very important, the development of ecological struggles. Yeah? And, uh, and on these ecological struggles, I would say there are three women who are showing you the way. Yeah? And it's not by accident that there are women. Yeah? Three women who show us the way. One, Naomi Klein. Yeah? in a book, uh, This Changed Everything, she used a, a very important concept uh, to speak about ecological struggles, blockadia, yeah? to block capitalist, destructive capitalist enterprise, be it a pipeline or the destruction of a forest or the poisoning of the water, we have to block them. Yeah? And such struggles are going on all the time yeah? in Canada, in the United States, Latin America and Europe. Sometimes there are victorious in France, for instance, we won this big fight huh, uh, against a new airport in Notre-Dame-de-Londres. 
big victory for the movement. Yeah? And in France, to give another example, we won the fight against uh, fracking, yeah? the, the extraction of oil and gas by, by fracking. Yeah? The two big, important victories. Yeah? So we have to fight to win victories, but also to develop through the struggles consciousness, consciousness of the need of self-organization and consciousness on who is the enemy. Yeah? The enemy is the government, but also beyond the government, it's the whole system. Yeah? So uh, Naomi Klein, blockade, it's a very important idea. Yeah? And then we have the, the other woman is a uh, young Greta Thunberg, of course. Yeah? You know, oh, you, you all know, who was able to uh, inspire this enormous youth mobilization all around the world under the slogan, uh, let's change the system, not the climate. Huh? No, this is very, very important. So we are very grateful to Greta Thunberg for doing the wonderful job of helping to raise consciousness and stimulate mobilization, mass mobilization. There were millions of people in these uh, school strikes and etc. Yeah, all around the world. So Greta Thunberg is another beautiful example. And the third woman I want to mention, which was unfortunately murdered, is uh, Berta Cáceres, yeah, which you probably heard of, the leader of an ecological indigenous movement in Honduras, who fought against the multinational enterprise who wanted to make uh, some um, dam which was ecologically very destructive and destroying the way of life of the indigenous communities. So she organized the resistance to this, uh, which was quite successful. So the organizers, or the heads of these multinational and of the police and army of Honduras, they organized a murder. Yeah? So Berto Cáceres is a real inspiration for us. And we have to recognize that indigenous communities, not only in Honduras, but all around the world, particularly in Canada, in the United States and in Latin America, are on the first, on the vanguard yeah, of the resistance against ecological destruction, in defense of their forests, of their land, of their waters against poisoning, by mines and the destruction by agribusiness and etc. by cattle growing. So they, they are on the first line, the first line in defense of the natural environment against capitalist destruction. And this, why many of them are being killed, like Berta Cáceres. Yeah? So these three women shows the way. Yeah? <laughs> and it not by accident they are women, yeah? because women are really, uh, again, on the first rank of these movements and these struggles. But obviously, uh, these movements are an important beginning. But what we want is the movements to grow and to lead to something like an anti capitalist revolutionary process, an eco socialist revolutionary process. This is our strategic aim. Yeah? And uh, here I would, I would would end my, my introduction by quoting a phrase by one of my favorite phrases by philosopher Walter Benjamin, Marxist, uh, Jewish, German philosopher Walter Benjamin, victim of fascism, who uh, wrote that, uh, referring to, to Marx, he said, Marx wrote that the revolutions are the locomotive of history. But perhaps the things are a little bit different. Perhaps revolutions are humanity pulling the emergency brake to stop the train. And I think this is exactly our situation today because we all, all of us are passengers of a suicidal train called Western modern industrial capitalist civilization. And this train is running at a growing velocity towards an abyss called climate change, ecological catastrophe. Yeah? So it's our task to 
try to stop this train yeah? and take a different road. <laughs> okay, that's all.